<clears throat> Good evening, everyone. How are you all? So welcome to our two weeks free session. So that's going to start that already started in our last session, right? So you guys had done our first free two week session, which was the psychiatry MSc role play session. And then this is our cardiology session. So tonight you are going to see that how, how we take classes on, on subject, subject based, especially for cardiology. We have a couple of clusters and just if you, if you can grab that cluster properly, using the same format, you can finish cardiology even with just two to three particular format. So that's the way that we actually show you how you can prepare your exam without the sh within the shortest possible time. And that usually based on cluster wise approach. A lot of candidates, they just go through cages and cages and eventually end up remembering about like 300 or 350 cages, which is even impossible for anyone to remember 350 cages. Now, if you can divide that cages into few cluster and you just remember those cluster, like you know the history format and the physical examination format, you just need to remember the management of that case. And that's all. Using the same format, you can finish those three or three, 300 or 350 cages just by remembering maybe 50 clusters. That's all that you will need. So that becomes so easy for your exam preparation. And that's the way to do it in the shortest possible time. If you really want to remember the cages, that's the easiest and the most effective way to do so. So we, you're going to see today that how we do these clusters and see that how important it is for your exam preparation. All right. So I can see that some of you are still in Facebook. As I said in the last session also, that the best way would be to join the Zoom sessions if you can. The Zoom ID is given in your Facebook group. So if you just use that Zoom ID and password just to join this session, then I don't need to go to the Facebook to see what you were, what you were writing in the comment section. And that becomes a lot easier for, for any of the class. And always remember that we don't take classes on Facebook. This is the two weeks free session. We are just doing it on both Zoom and Facebook. But after two weeks, when you join the course, it would be on Zoom always. Now tonight we are going to do the cardiology session. So cardiology, I have divided it into two theory sessions followed by one role play session. Remember the psychiatry? So we did a psychiatry MSc theory session first, and then we did a role play on that. So that's exactly the format that we follow in our course. Throughout the five months course, you will get to know about it. You will get to learn the theory first, followed by doing the role play on the important cases that appear in exam sometimes. So that's very important way to learn that first you know the cages and then you do role play with me or any of the other doctors. And that's how you learn actually. You learn first and then you do role play. And with the combination of both, you actually have a solid preparation for your exam. And that's, that's the reason why our candidates pass the exam, most of them in the first attempt. As you can see in the previous result, in 2021, almost everyone who appeared the exam, they passed. Some of them, now no one can say that 100% passing rate in AMC clinical. Some of them can fail, but if, even if someone fails, they just, they fail in very narrow margin, like nine cases passed, and the only one cases they, they failed. And that, that's actually very unlucky for them, but none of them, who appeared the exam in the in 2021 they actually none of them failed like really bad bad way so the passing rate is so high 
from the candidates who are who are, who are actually giving exam from this course. So you can you guys can have a look on our Facebook post that how many candidates has passed in 2021. That's really amazing. And that actually happened with a lot of role play, a lot of cages discussion throughout the course and having a very good materials that help them to prepare for the exam. And that's that's the that's the way to learn actually. You you get to know the cages, you do the role play, and somehow you also make your own format in your head. And eventually you pass the exam. Okay. Now let's not double too much. Let's just start our session tonight. If you guys have any question, feel free to write it in the chat box. And once we finish today's class, any question about the course, feel free to ask in the chat box. Okay. All right. So cardiology. The first cluster that we are going to do tonight is syncope cluster. So all of you should know that syncope means loss of consciousness. In a patient who has syncope, what could be the differential diagnosis? What do you think? So let's say a 50 year old coming to you as like a, like a recent syncopal attack or multiple episode of loss of consciousness. What do you think that should be your usual differential diagnosis? If you just divide it into a couple of main subtypes, like what could be the causes? So first of all, you just think two system, which is mainly related with syncope. So loss of consciousness means that your brain somehow is not getting enough blood supply. How your brain gets blood supply? From your heart? So maybe something is wrong with the heart. Or maybe brain itself is not working properly. So something is wrong in the brain. So you're, there could be CNS causes. There could be CVS causes. So that, these are the two most important systems that we need to rule out in a syncope cluster. And there are lots of other miscellaneous causes that we are going to learn now. So anytime when we do a cluster, the most important thing is to learn about the differential diagnosis. Remember guys, any cluster that you learn, your differential diagnosis is the most important thing. If you know at least five to 10 differential diagnosis for a particular cluster, you pass that history immediately. So in exam, whatever is the task, if history is a task, you should always try to rule out differential diagnosis. So let's say we have got a patient with syncope, what could be our differential diagnosis? So CVS causes, CNS causes, and miscellaneous or other causes. In case of CVS cause, we have got arrhythmia. So any kind of arrhythmia can result in syncope. Valvular heart disease, so aortic stenosis, very, very important for exam, comes in exam with syncope. So aortic stenosis is one of the important. Hookum, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, that's also another important, not very important for exam, but you need to rule that out. Then myocardial infarction or ischemic heart disease. And another arrhythmia is prolonged QT syndrome. So that's also one of the important case for your exam. So in case of CVS, you can just remember by arrhythmia, valvular heart disease, and ischemic heart disease. So these are the main three things that will get covered up in cardiology, or in CVS, sorry. So in CVS, we are trying to rule out arrhythmia, including prolonged QT syndrome, ischemic heart disease, including MI, and then valvular heart disease, aortic stenosis, or hookum. And then CNS. In CNS, always remember trauma, tumor, infection, stroke, epilepsy. That's the five causes always you can rule out. So trauma, tumor, infection. Infection is meningitis or encephalitis. Tumor means brain tumor. So trauma means head injury. So trauma, tumor, infection, stroke, and epilepsy. These are the five causes that we always rule out in CNS cause. And others, what else can, can cause syncope in a patient? Vasovagal syncope, very important. 
posturals hypotension. So they usually say that when they change position from sitting to a standing position, especially when they get up in the morning, they feel lightheadedness or sometimes even they lose consciousness. That's postural hypotension. What is vasovagal syncope? Usually the usual cases are like patient was running marathon in a hot sunny weather and then suddenly patient just had a, had a syncope. So what happens in a hot sunny weather, somehow when you are over exerting yourself, especially in the hot weather or prolonged standing anywhere, sometimes your vagus nerve gets stimulated and what vagus nerves cause? It causes peripheral vasodilation. Peripheral vasodilation means that you are having a lot of blood collection in your extremities, like in your leg. And if there is a lot of collection of blood in your leg, your brain, your heart is not getting enough blood supply because all the blood is now in the extremities. If your heart not getting enough blood supply, it cannot pump enough blood to go to the brain. So your brain also doesn't get enough blood and you end up having a syncope. So that's vasovagal syncope. Hypoglycemia sometimes can present with loss of consciousness. Anemia can be a cause. Some of the medication can cause syncope, especially those medications which reduce your blood pressure, like a diuretic or anything. Sometimes even psychogenic cause can result in syncope, stress-induced or sometimes even conversion disorder patient can present with a syncope. And sometimes alcohol-induced, like alcohol withdrawal, alcohol toxicity, that can also present with syncope. So these are your main differential diagnosis. What is the important case for your exam? That's always important to know. In, in AMC Clinical, it's not only about how knowledgeable you are, it's also about how smart you are. So you need to know that what are the important cases for exam, which is commonly asked questions. So commonly asked is your aortic stenosis. That's also a case from your handbook. Then prolonged QT syndrome is important for exam. I haven't seen any time CNS related causes coming with syncope. Vasovagal syncope is very common. Postural hypotension is important. Then sometimes a recurrent fall also come. So we will discuss that as well. So these are actually arrhythmia, prolonged QT syn syndrome, aortic stenosis, vasovagal, postural. These four or five cases are most important in this cluster. Now, why I'm saying this thing is that just by learning one specific format, you, you get four or five cases done already. So what happens, your exam preparation becomes concise and you don't need to remember every cases differently. So that is the way to learn. As I say always, cluster-wise approach is the most important approach for passing your clinical exam. Now, let's move on to history. So this one history format, it will help you to Remember the five or six cases, which is important for your exam. All right. Now, now that you are going for both online exam and face-to-face -face exam, you need to be prepared for both. Always remember, you don't know when you are going to appear at the exam and where. Like, what would be the method of your exam? Is it online or face-to-face? -face? So you, you don't know now. So you have to be prepared for both. But someone of you, if you already booked your exam, then only just think about that particular mood of exam. You don't need to learn the other one. Now, throughout the course, we are going to discuss both format of exam so that you are prepared in any way. So in case of face-to-face -face exam, that means you are going into the exam hall and there are 16 room in the exam hall, in 16 room, there are 16 patient and 16 examiners are there. So you get to see the examiner, you get to see the role player. And there are 16 room like that. You, you get a 
you get 10 minutes for each of those stations, right? Two minutes outside, eight minutes inside the room. In the two minutes outside, you will get the case in, in a monitor outside the, outside the room. And in that monitor, everyone, everyone who is appearing the exam, everyone will be in front of a particular room. And everyone will rotate from case one to case 16. Now, in two minute time, you get the question in a monitor outside and you just see, you just read the question, think about what you are going to ask to this patient. So at that time, you think about the differential diagnosis, you think about how you are going to ask questions and what kind of questions you are going to ask to this patient. And then you go in, examiner greet you, they check your ID that if you are the correct person who is coming into the exam, and then they introduce you with the role player. Once they introduce you with the role player, your exam time already started. So with this introduction and everything, you might lose like 15 seconds at that time. And then you start your exam. So in face-to-face, -face, you get to see your examiner and also you get to see the role player. And role player, most of the time, they might be sitting in a table or maybe lying on a couch, depending on the case. You introduce yourself with the role player and then you start your case, okay? That's your face-to-face -face for format for every case. Now, let's talk about online. In online exam, you can't see the examiner. There is an invigilator who, who conduct the exam, helps with any of the issue that arises during the online exam, but they don't answer your question. In case of online exam, same, there will be on the screen, two minutes, you will get a reading time and then eight minutes with the role player, you will be able to see the role player as a video. And that happens in a Zoom session, just like this. All right, now the only difference between an online and face-to-face -face is that in online exam, you can't see the examiner, you can't ask anything from the examiner. But there are some of the tasks which ask you to explain things to the examiner, you will just pretend that there, are, there is someone and you will just explain the things with the examiner if there is a task like that. But examiner is not going to say anything. There, is, there will be a person as an examiner in the Zoom session, but you can't see them, all right? And also they don't answer you. And in case of face-to-face -face exam, they, you can see the examiner and you can ask questions and they answer your question. So that's the, that's the difference, the main difference between face-to-face -face and online. Why I'm saying or taking a lot of time in this particular part, because there is an importance for that. Now, let's say in, in case of face-to-face -face exam, if you get a patient who is presenting to you with acute symptom, you need to make sure that that patient is hemodynamically stable or not in case of face-to-face. -face. Okay? So if you, get, if you are going for a face-to-face -face exam and that's the acute case, like acute abdomen, acute loss, loss of consciousness, those cases, you need to make sure that your patient is hemodynamically stable first. Once you make sure the patient is stable, then only you can proceed for your history. And that's one of the key steps in face-to-face. -face. So how we do that? Let's, let's do this case, the initial part, as a face-to-face -face first. So let's say the, this patient name is John, and John presenting to you with a loss of consciousness yesterday when he was playing tennis with his colleague. Now, then John presented to you today. The first, how we are going to start the case, that's really important. Your approach should be really friendly, gentle, and reassuring. 
say that, hi, John, this is Dr. Arshan, one of the doctor here. It's very nice to meet you. John, I get to know from the note that you had a loss of consciousness yesterday while you were playing tennis with your colleague. I'm really sorry to hear that. Please don't worry, now that you are here, I'll try my best to find out why you lost your consciousness and also try to manage try to manage any of your symptoms that you are having at the moment. How are you feeling now? I'm feeling good, doctor. All right, that's really nice to know. John, because you had a loss of consciousness yesterday, I would like to make sure you are vitally stable from my examiner. Please excuse me for a moment. I will come back to you immediately. You turn your chair towards the examiner and say, dear examiner, I would like to know if my patient vital is stable for further history. If examiner says skip or continue your task, then you just assume the patient is vitally stable. Sometimes examiner can say, stick to your task. That means that they don't want to say if the patient is stable or not. You just continue your history with the patient. If the examiner say, what do you mean? That means they are trying to ask you that what do you actually mean by this thing? That means you need to ask examiner, I would like to know my patient's blood pressure, pulse, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, and temperature. You never ask more than two questions from the examiner at a time. So you just ask examiner, I would like to know the blood pressure, including any postural drop with pulse. Examiner says blood pressure is 120 by 80, no postural drop, pulse rate is 90. I would like to know respiratory rate, temperature, and oxygen saturation as well, doctor. Examiner says stable, proceed. So then you proceed to your further history. So you turn your chair towards the patient and say, thank you so much, John, for waiting. I, am, I'm, I made sure that you are vitally stable, and that's really good. Now, John, would you please tell me a little bit more about what exactly happened yesterday? Now, always remember your question should be an open-ended question. Always. There is no other way, no other alternative of asking an open-ended question initially. You always ask that, can you tell me a little bit more about what exactly happened yesterday? Why we are asking this that the role player is supposed to give you some information. They have something given from the AMC that these are the things you are supposed to give to the candidate. So if you don't ask that open-ended question, you might miss that. So that's why I always ask it. Now, patient might be saying to you like this, this, this happened, doctor. Then what else you need to find out? In a patient who is having syncopal attack, our first history is divided into three things. What happened before syncope? So that's pre-syncopal question. What happened during syncope? And what happened after syncope? All right, so that's how you're going to proceed. Now, let's just pause in here because after that, everything is same, online and face-to-face. Now, let's assume that we are going to go for an online exam, how we should do in this particular case. Now, remember one thing, guys. I will assume that you know you will know these things by the end of this free two-week session. Tonight, we are going to go in depth. But after two-week session, when you, when you know this approach, I'm not going to repeat it again and again. And we'll just say that, well, this is your initial approach you already know. So let's just start with the next thing. So now tonight is mainly on building your approach. And then next class, we, will, we are not going to talk more about these things. We'll, we'll go more towards the cages at that time. Now let's say that this is an online exam. So same, same question. Patient is in front of you in the video. Invigilator is there, and also an examiner is there. Ex you can't see the examiner. You can't ask anything from the examiner. 
online exam is more about pretending that these are these are already here and saying that you want to do these things because you can't do it exactly so you just pretend that you would like to do these things so think in that way for an online exam you just need to say that you would like to do this 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 so hi john this is dr x one of the doctor here i got to know from the notes that you had a loss of consciousness where you were playing tennis with your colleague last night i'm really sorry to know that john but please don't worry now that you are here i'm going to find out why you lost your consciousness and i'll try my best to manage any of your symptoms that you're having now john because you had a loss of consciousness the first thing that i would like to do to measure your blood pressure your pulse your respiratory rate oxygen saturation and temperature to make sure you are vitally stable and you are ready for me to ask you questions is that okay with you yes doctor that's fine now you can't ask it to the examiner so that's why you just say that you would like to do that now examiner is pointing that thing already because now examiner knows that yes this examiner knows how to start this kind of cages and you get a tick at that time and you just say next that well john so would you please tell me a little bit more about what exactly happened last night so what happened in in between the hemodynamic stability and this open ended question so let's say please don't worry now that you are here i'll try my best to manage your symptoms and also before you because you had a loss of consciousness i would like to make sure you are vitally stable so i would check your this 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 now john would you please tell me a little bit more about what exactly happened last night so you don't need to ask it from the examiner you just say that you would like to do that now a lot of lot of people don't don't say that thing now for an online exam this is not so important okay if you don't say that you would you would like to ask the you would like to check the vitals in online exam that doesn't cost you the whole case so if you don't ask it that's fine but for face to face that's a must but for for our candidate i always advise them to to say this line that you would like to check the vitals to make sure you are vitally stable and then you go for open ended question is this clear for everyone is there any confusion in here correct all right now let's move on to this particular format so what uh, let me just see your chat box clear okay good and also those who are in facebook you guys can just write it in the comment section i will be able to have a look if you want to know anything now after that your online and face to face doesn't matter so let's start your question so can you please tell me a little bit more about what exactly happened so patient gives you some of the information but what you really need to know if you don't get it from the patient's information you just ask that question now that's one of the tricky part remember one thing the examiner is a human being you need to convince the examiner that yes see you you are a dedicated candidate you are a sincere candidate and how you do that one of the important thing to show to the examiner that you are very sincere that you don't ask things which is already given by your role player or which is already given in the stem now if in the stem it's already written that patient is hemodynamically stable and you are again asking it that means that you did not read the question properly and that doesn't look good to an examiner some examiner can feel that you are not sincere enough and you are not very you are not you are not a good candidate that is the thing let's say it, the patient already said to you that doctor there this happened two times before as well 
what you did after you just after saying that you asked the patient how like did it happen any time before or is it the first time so what happened that means that you did not actually listen to this patient carefully and a lot of candidates because they just memorize some notes they just eventually do this kind of thing and what happens that examiner doesn't like it all right so if you already get something from the stem you don't need to ask that again if you already get an information from a from a role player already don't ask it again this is very very important okay so you need to find out what exactly were you doing at that time now if if in the question you already know patient was playing tennis or if the patient already told you that i was playing i was playing tennis and then i got this you don't need to ask this question but these are the question i have kept in here that this is important for us to know all right so what exactly were you doing at that time did it happen for the first time if it is not the first time you need to also find out what happened in the previous episode so what exactly were you doing at that time did it happen suddenly or did you feel any kind of symptoms before you fall any syncope patient you always need to find out if there is any prodromal symptoms that means a lot of cases you will find out kind of prodromal symptoms of lightheadedness sweating hunger tremor a lot of prodromal symptoms happen before patient actually lose consciousness and some patients actually know that they are going to fall and when you get something like that that suggest more towards vasovagal syncope or sometimes neurological syncope cardiac syncope usually happens without any prodromal symptoms and the patients usually also regain consciousness very rapidly whereas the exactly opposite happens in a vasovagal syncope patient gets prodromal symptom and then fall and then also regain consciousness gradually so that's why we are asking this question did you fall suddenly or did you have any symptoms before that like did you have any lightheadedness or dizziness did you have any headache any blurring of vision any weakness in anywhere in your body okay so these are the questions for pre syncope you can also add some of the other question like any tremor did you feel sweaty before you fall or did you know that you are going to fall so these are the pre syncopal questions so did you fall suddenly or you had any symptoms like lightheadedness or dizziness did you know that you are going to fall did you have any headache or blurring of vision no doctor did you have any weakness anywhere else in your body no doctor all right now after pre syncope then you you have your syncope question now when a patient lose their consciousness they don't know what happened in in that time so that's why you need to find out where there any witness or like were you alone at that time or were there anyone who witnessed your fall and loss of consciousness obviously when a patient was playing tennis there was someone so you, you just need to find out who was there and you say that if you give me the consent i would like to ask him what exactly happened when you lost your consciousness so that's the question were there any witness if patient says no then you don't bother if yes then say if you please give me the consent i would like to ask him about you what exactly happened when you lost your consciousness is that okay with you yes doctor now this is pretending you will not get that witness in the exam you just say that you would like to do that and examiner is happy with that and what else you would ask now some patient does not get total loss of consciousness they just get a pre syncope that they they just have a fall but they don't lose consciousness so you just need to find out did you completely lose your consciousness yes doctor do you know how long were you unconscious most of the patient will say i am not sure doctor 
did you get any jerking movement anywhere else anywhere in your body now jerking movement is mainly for epilepsy very important to rule out did you wet yourself or lose your stool that's also epilepsy did you bite your tongue that's also epilepsy and did you injure your head it's a very important thing when someone have a fall and lost their consciousness they most likely they will hit the head so head injury is very important to rule out in these cases so during syncope were there any witness did you lose did you completely lose your consciousness yes doctor how long did you have any jerking movements did you wet yourself or lose your stool did you bite your tongue and did you injure your head after that that's your post syncope question now after you regained your consciousness were you able to stand by yourself or someone helped you and did you feel confused and drowsy after you regained consciousness if yes how long you were you were having this confusion that's called post ictal confusion some patients who has seizure they get a prolonged post ictal confusion so if you get a seizure patient or a epileptic patient you need to find that time so did you feel confused and drowsy any weakness or any your vision or speech because a stroke or tia is one of your differential diagnosis that's why we always ask this question any weakness anywhere in your body any problem with your vision or your speech now that you asked your pre syncope syncope and post syncope question then you move to your differential diagnosis question one by one we are going to ask all the dd so cvs any chest pain any shortness of breath or any racing of your heart patient with aortic stenosis having syncope they will say yes doctor i i, I get a kind of chest tightness so then you uh, then you go in detail the in the exam if you get something positive you go in detail otherwise you just ask questions and move forward now if patient says that yes doctor sometimes i feel chest tightness not exactly pain then you need to move you need to find out all the pain related questions so where exactly do you feel the pain does it go to anywhere okay do you get the pain at rest or when you do some exercise or exertion so all the chest pain related question you need to ask at that time we have a cluster on that so we'll discuss the chest pain question later on so for cvs only one question chest pain shortness of breath or racing of your heart so now all of most of you are beginner can you can you get it in here that i have not used any medical jargon in the history that's very important what is racing of heart palpitation right if you ask the patient like do you have any palpitation a lot of people know what is palpitation but in the exam they can just ask you what what is that doctor then you just waste your time so try to use all non medical jargon as much as you can so any chest pain any difficulty breathing any racing of your heart with this question you actually cover all the cvs related questions so cvs related one is your arrhythmia so racing of the heart gets covered with that for ischemic heart disease patient get chest pain mainly and sometimes difficulty in breathing so you are asking that also and for who come there is not much to ask same questions so all the questions of cvs you just need to ask these three question that's all then move to the cns you already asked a lot of cns related question but if you missed something you can just ask it here now you ruled out tia or a stroke by asking any weakness by asking any trouble with your vision or speech you already asked about did you hit your head that's covered by head injury you also asked did you bite your tongue wet yourself or jerky movement so epilepsy you also asked what else you did not ask infection so for infection that means meningitis or encephalitis you just ask do you have any fever any rash 
any neck pain or neck stiffness. So your CNS, CBS is done. Then you move to the miscellaneous. We have vasovagal, hypoglycemia, and postural hypertension. These are the three most important ones. For hypoglycemia, only one question that we ask that when you had your loss of consciousness, by any chance that you skipped your meal that time. So it, if it happened in, in the afternoon, you can ask that, did you skip your breakfast during that time? Okay, or, or also you can ask that, do you have any history of diabetes? Because if patient is diabetic, and then they take insulin and somehow they missed meal after taking insulin and then they went for tennis playing or any kind of walking or exercise, they can get hypoglycemic attack, right? So you just need to find that out by your history. So did you skip your meal, to, meal today or did you skip your meal that day? All right, if yes or no, you can also ask that, do you have any history of diabetes? If yes, then you move to the next question. Next is vasovagal. In vasovagal syncope, there is nothing much to ask. One question sometimes we ask that, when you were playing tennis, was it a hot, sunny weather? Okay, so hot, sunny weather, it's one of the question for vasovagal syncope. Usually, we don't have any particular question for this. For postural hypotension, do you feel dizzy or lightheadedness when you change your position from sitting to standing, especially when you get, get up from the morning? So patient with postural hypotension, they will always say that, uh, that I feel quite dizzy or lightheadedness when I change my position. So that's your postural hypotension question. After that, you have anemia, one of your DD. So you can just ask that, do you feel tired or fatigued these days? Or anyone told you that you look really pale these days? Stress, so who do you live with at home? Are you a happy family? Is there any stress at your home or at your work? And then lastly, finish with past medical history, SADMA and family history. Remember? You always wrap up your history by these three things, especially in the medicine. Past medical history, so how is your general health? Do you have any medical condition like diabetes, high blood pressure, or any other heart disease? So specifically, you can ask some of the condition depending on the case. For this case, diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease is important. Then SADMA. For SADMA, remember in psychiatry, we told you that what is SADMA, but SADMA, only thing it is important for your exam is asking about a smoking, alcohol, and medication history. Sometimes we also ask allergic history, depending on the case where we need to give antibiotic for the patient. So for SADMA, you will ask that do you smoke or drink alcohol? Are you taking any medication? Do you have any allergies? Any family history of sudden death, especially related with any heart. So very important thing to ask in this particular question or particular syncope cluster that sudden cardiac death history in a family, two things is important to consider. What are those two? Very good. How come? And yes, Dr. Ariba, very good. Prolonged QT syndrome. AS is not hereditary. So we don't worry about AS in case of sudden cardiac death, but two of them, which is important is one is hookum and another is prolonged QT syndrome. These two usually have a family history of sudden cardiac death in a younger, in a younger age. All right. So this is how you will finish the case. And then you say, thank you so much for all the information, John. Now, that's your history. If we give a summary now, so in history, you start with like introduction, reassurance, and then make sure patient is vitally stable. Then ask 
the open-ended question, starting with pre-syncope, syncope, post-syncope post question, followed by differential diagnosis, CNS, CVS, hypoglycemia, vesovagal postural hypertension, anemia, stress, followed by past medical history, SADMA, and family history. All right, so you just need to keep it in your head that this is exactly how I'm going to ask questions in any syncope, any, any syncope question. That's the particular format I will always ask. Now, again, there will be a little bit of changes depending on if it is a face-to-face -face or online exam. In online exam, because you don't have that opportunity to ask finding from the examiner. Most of the time, they provide the physical examination finding on the screen. So on your task, most of the time, it will be written that history from the patient for five minutes, a physical examination card will be given on the screen after five minutes. So after five minutes, or when your history is done, a physical examination card will be appeared giving the in giving all the examination findings so that you can diagnose the case properly that's online version most of the time whereas in face to face exam you need to ask physical examination finding from examiner sometimes they also give you a card of finding but very very rarely so how we do it on face to face first let's discuss that so in face to face once your history is done, you, you say, thank you so much, John, for all the information that you have given. Now I'm going to ask some questions about your findings to the examiner. Please excuse me for a moment. I'll be back in a minute. Then you turn towards the examiner and say, dear examiner, I would like to do physical examination on my patient, starting with the general appearance. Is my patient in distress or comfortable. Examiner says, as you can see, that's fine. Then we ask pickled. What is pickled? Pickled is a general appearance finding or general examination that we do. Now, pickled means pallor. That means your anemia. Then you have icterus or jaundice. C for cyanosis, A for clubbing, although I know that should be C, but just remember at clubbing is K, lymph phenanopathies, E for edema, and D for dehydration. Now, we don't need to ask all of it, like a patient who is having uh, let's say having abdominal pain, you don't need to ask cyanosis for that patient, right? So depending on the case, you just ask the important one or relevant one. Always remember relevant physical examination, relevant history is important. You just, do, you just don't ask everything. And that suggests you don't know anything about this case. So relevant physical examination is what they actually ask from you. So for this particular case, Pallor is really important, right? Because one of your DD is anemia. For someone having heart-related problem, cyanosis can be an important one. Like if it's a congenital heart disease, cyanosis can be there. So you can ask it. Clubbing, you can ask. Lymph node, not very important. Edema, dehydration, you can ask. So you can just ask from the examiner. Examiner, I would like to know is if there is any pallor or any cyanosis. Examiner says no, always two, two things at a time. Never ever say, examiner, I would like to know if there is any pallor, ictera, cyanosis, clubbing, lymph node, edema, dehydration. A lot of candidates do that, okay? So if you do that, examiner will be so pissed. Don't ne never ever do that, okay? Just two questions at a time. So e examiner, is there any pallor or any cyanosis? No. Any clubbing, edema or dehydration? No. Sometimes you can ask three at the second time, like how I did, that's also fine. Then vitals and BMI, always I keep vitals and BMI at the same time. Some cases BMI is not important, 
just because I don't want to forget it, I always keep BMI with the vitals. So I would like to know the vitals, blood pressure with postural drop. In this case, postural drop is important because why? What's the reason, guys? Why we need to know postural drop in this case? Yeah, but Nidhi, very good. So postural hypotension is one of your differential, right? So that's why we need to ask it. Otherwise, you can just miss it. And only thing that will be positive in a postural hypotension case is this thing. So if you don't ask it, you just miss the whole case. And they will never ever give it to you unless you ask. Okay? So doctor, I would like to know the vitals of my patient, blood pressure in blood pressure with postural drop. And examiner says that on standing this, on sitting this. And I would like to know the pulse, rate and rhythm. Why it is important, rate and rhythm? Many cases, we don't bother with the rhythm, but for CVS, we always, we always ask it because arrhythmia is one of your DD. If, the, if it's an irregular rhythm, it suggests AF, atrial fibrillation, right? So that's why we ask it. For this particular case, the vitals is very important. So doctor, I would like to know the blood pressure, including the postural blood pressure, and I would like to know the pulse rate, rate and rhythm, okay? So it's, again, it's, if we start, say that, doctor, I would like to know the general appearance. Is my patient comfortable or in distress? Examiner says, as you can see, I would like to know if there is any pallor or cyanosis. Examiner says, no. Any clubbing, edema, or dehydration? No. I would like to know the vitals of my patient, starting with the blood pressure, with postural blood pressure. Examiner says this, this. I would like to know the pulse, rate, and rhythm. I would like to know respiratory rate, saturation, and temperature, please. I would start my examination from head to toe, but first I would like to focus on the neck. I would like to know if there is any raised JVP or carotid bruit. Then I would like to focus on cardiovascular system. On inspection, is there any visible cardiac impulse? No. On palpation, is the apex bit in normal position? Or you can say, I would like to know the position of the apex bit. Is there any palpable thrill? Any para-external hip or palpable pito? I would like to do auscultation. Apart from S1 and S2, is there any added sound like any murmur? Sometimes you also ask pericardial rub if it's the pericarditis case. So that's how you will ask CVS from your examiner. So always focus or start the main system which you actually want to find out. Like for a patient who is having syncope, you're your focus is on CVS and CNS. So you ask the CVS fully, you ask CNS fully, and then other system you just say you would like to do. An examiner doesn't bother with that. Okay, so on CVS, this is how you're going to ask. If there is any finding, examiner will give it to you. And then you say, I would like to do full central nervous system examination, including the cranial nerves. And then I would like to finish with all other systemic examination, including respiratory system and abdomen. You don't need to ask specifically what you want to do. That other system is not very relevant in here. And always we ask at the end, is there any office test available? What is office test? Office test means that the test which you can do on the bedside. For AMC, there are four or five office test that usually you can ask. And it should be relevant also. So in this case, we can ask urine dipstick, blood sugar level, and ECG. Urine dipstick is not so important, but still we ask it for everyone. And in here for CVS, blood sugar is very important. Also hypoglycemia is one of your DD, so BSL is important. And always in any CVS case, we ask ECG. What are the other office tests that we can ask? If it's a pregnant patient, or if you think that it's a pregnant patient, you can do a pregnancy test, which is urine pregnancy test. 
that's the bit side office test. Sometimes asthma COPD, you might need to know the spirometry. So spirometry is the office test. All right. Sometimes if you need to know the ABG or VVG, like an arterial or venous blood gash, then you can ask it. But remember one thing. Chest X-ray is not an office test. So never ever ask chest X-ray as an office test in the exam. Now you might ask that sometimes we can do X-ray in the bedside also. Yes, we can, but don't think in that way for the exam purpose. Okay. Now, if any of the office test result is available, examiner will give it to you. Otherwise, examiner will say unavailable or not done. So that's how you are going to do the physical examination from examiner in case of face-to-face -face exam. So for face-to-face -face exam, the task is like this. So take history from the patient, ask physical examination finding from your examiner, your examiner will only give the findings that you ask and then give diagnosis and differential diagnosis to the patient. Or sometimes they ask, ask for investigation from examiner or discuss further management option with the patient. So depending on the task, your cases will go in that way. Okay, so is this clear for everyone how this happens in online and face-to-face? In online exam, most of the time a card will be given saying that patient, patient looks comfortable. They will give you the vitals, BMI, all the findings will be given. You just need to read that and then move to the next task. So Dr. Ariba, so you just say that you would like to know if there is any office test available like urine dipstick, blood sugar, and ECG. If, it, if it's available, examiner will say, like, this is the ECG or it's not available. So you just say, you just ask it. All right, any question, guys? I can see that some of you asked Dr. Ismutara, in face-to-face, -face, do we just ask examiner or have to check vitals? So that means, remember in the first, when we say that you need to ask it from the examiner, sometimes examiner give you the vitals at that time, sometimes they just say, move on or stick to your task. Then you, didn't, you, then you just move on, you don't ask it. But if not, if examiner says, what do you mean? Or what do you want to know? Then you need to ask it. And Dr. Namia, yes, you will have these slides later. It's, the slides are for the course students. Once you, once you get into the course, and then you get into the software, and then you get these slides. And Dr. Manoz, yes, any emotional stress, frightening conditions, sudden shock can also result in vesovagal syncope. Good question, Dr. Manoz, that about office test in online exam, do we get positive findings in CARD? Now, as you know that if it's, if it's card, you don't need to ask anything extra. Everything that is supposed to be given, that's there. So if, if, the, if they want you to give any office test, that will be written there. Otherwise, you don't need to ask, ask it. Yes, Dr. Javaid, if vitals point to shock, then we have to follow the DRS ABCD protocol. Tonight, we are not going into that direction. There are cages in cardiology. We will discuss that. What do you need to do at that time? 
No, you don't need to explain the physical examination findings to the patient. So it's exactly written in the exam question sometimes that you don't need to read physical examination loudly. So in online exam, you the card is given to you. You just read it, get the findings, and go for the next task. You don't need to explain the findings to the patient. Yeah, if patient denies fever rash, it's still it's a good idea to ask for neck stiffness. Very good question, Dr. Sam. In the interpersonal skill, should we also ask about patient ideas, concerns, expectations? It's mainly related when patient is, is a cancer patient and you are going to discuss it as a breaking bad news. In those stations, these interpersonal skills are mainly assessed. And if there is a management task, then also these skills are usually asked or assessed. So, but for something which is a history diagnosis differential, this is not very important, all right? So, and always in your explanation, you always ask the patient that, are you understanding me? Do you have any questions? And that's how you, 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 you are getting the assessment in the interpersonal level. All good guys. So that's your history format and physical examination format for a syncope cluster. Now you don't have any questions. So what we will do, we'll take a 10 minute break now. And then we are going to do the, all the cases that is needed for your, for your syncope questions. Okay, so there are three, four cases under syncope cluster. You will see later on that how, how easy it becomes after knowing the history and physical examination. All right, so let's just take a 10 minute break now. Keep thinking in your head that what will be the history, what will be the physical examination finding. And then we're coming back in 10 minutes time. All right, so 10 minute break guys. Thank you all.
All right, everyone. So let's just start again. I've got a question from Dr. Cynthia. So in online exam, when the task is to do physical examination, then how to proceed? There will be a card too. Now that's a question that will be will be discussed a lot. Now, online exam, one of the other thing you need to understand in terms of exam preparation that there are some, some stations which is only physical examination and there are most of the stations which are like this, like you need to take a history, then physical examination on card or ask it from the examiner and then diagnosis and DD. In the history cases, you don't need to do the physical examination on a patient, but in case of just physical examination case, in face to face, you have to do it on a patient, and then you just need to give running commentary that what you found, what you have found out during your examination. So don't get get into confusion at the moment about that because we have one month physical examination class in the course you will get to know those cages, all right? Now, in, in very rare cages, sometimes even in online exam, they ask you to explain what physical examination you are going to do on a patient. So if, like without giving you a card, first, they ask you to explain what you are going to do on this patient. Sometimes they ask you to explain this to the examiner or sometimes they ask you to explain this to the patient. So that time, if it is the examiner explanation, you just need to pretend that the examiner is hearing you and you just need to say that, dear examiner, I would like to do physical examination on my patient. And you just say all those physical examination things to the examiner. And after you have done it, then examiner, then you will be given a card, okay? So that's how some, some cases in, in exam works. And there are some cages which is only physical examination. Okay, like the cages will give you a scenario of acute knee pain in a patient. And then they will ask you explain physical examination to a medical student, explain how you're going to do physical examination to this patient. So that's actually just physical examination case. That's not a history or any other thing. So that's, a tot that's another kind of scenario that you get in your exam. Let's not go in that direction tonight because physical examination is a huge thing for AMC preparation. And we are going to have one month solely on physical examination cases. Okay, but not tonight. Tonight is mainly on, on, on these medicine cases. There is no, nothing like that, Dr. Nidhi, that how many cages will come in exam in terms of physical exam. There are three or four cages. Most of the time you get in the exam as a physical examination only. But not, I haven't seen like more than four. It's max four. Sometimes if you're lucky, you can get only one or two. Very good question, Dr. Moni. If it's a long scenario, like you can't complete the reading in two minute time, there are cages which might be like three pages and you will not be able to even read, read the case in two minute time. In that case, you go into the room, you introduce yourself with the patient and excuse yourself from the patient, say that, John, this is Dr. Arshan, one of the doctors here. It's very nice to meet you. John, please excuse me for a moment. I would like to read the notes of your presentation, and then I will, I'm going to talk to you in detail about it. Is it okay with you? So you just take an excuse from the patient, but never ever, never ever just go in after two minutes and, it's, and keep, do, keep reading the case. You have to introduce yourself when you go into the room, or when your eight minute insight starts. You introduce yourself with the patient and you take an excuse from the patient that you want to read the case first and then you would like to start asking questions. And that's completely fine.
All right, now let's move on to our cases. So aortic stenosis is the first case that we are going to discuss. Same in online, Dr. Monir, you just need to take an excuse from the patient that you would like to, like to, like to read, this, read the case. The case is always in front of you. You can always ask the invigilator that you would like to read the next page. But if your two minutes is up and you start your eight minutes, you, you need to take a permission from the patient that you, need, you want to read the case first. So this is one of the question. You are a GP and your next patient is a 52-year-old male who is consulting about recent loss of consciousness. Take a focused history from the patient. Now, this task is mainly related with your face-to-face. -face. So in the face-to-face, -face, they will say, ask physical examination finding from examiner. Sometimes they will ask you, ask investigation from examiner and explain it to the patient or explain it to the examiner. And then sometimes they will ask you to give diagnosis and differential to the patient. Sometimes even they will ask, explain further management to the patient. So task will be different case by case. And these are the cases, like these are the task. Task is either history, physical examination, sometimes like, in very small number of cases, they ask you to ask investigations, sometimes explain investigation to the examiner or to the patient. Like if there is an ECG given, most of the time they ask you to explain that ECG to the examiner. Sometimes they give X-ray and they ask you to explain the X-ray to the patient. So these are the things that comes and then give your diagnosis and differential and management. So these are all the tasks that comes in the exam, but not, not four or five tasks like this. In exam, most of the time you will get two tasks, like history, give diagnosis and differential. Sometimes they give history, PFE on card, diagnosis and differential. So no, usually most of the time you get two to three tasks. In very small number of cases, you get four tasks, which include management. In that time, you have to be very quick with your history taking and managing the time. Now, time management is a thing which comes with a lot of role play and make sure once you start the course with us, every day you need to start your role play with your study buddy. You can't just think that Dr. Arshan is, is going to do role play with me and that's all I need. No, this is not, this is not my my job to make you role play. You guys need to do the role play by yourself. But yes, in, in our classes, I'm going to do role play with you. Our uh, Dr. Dr. Cynthia is going to do role play with you. We, we will do role play as much as we can, but that responsibility is also yours to do the role play every day. Without doing role play every day, there is no way you are going to make it in the first attempt. Okay, there is no other alternative, guys. You know the cages now, and you do the role play based on how I am showing it to you. So the total time for each question is 10 minutes. Two minutes is outside reading time, and eight minutes is for this task. Now, let's say you have got this question, right? So. Right now, you already know what to ask in the history because we already discussed that. You also know what to ask in the physical examination. If it's a face-to-face, -face, you know what to ask from the examiner. If it's an online exam, you also know if they ask you to explain this physical examination with the examiner. Right now, you don't know how to explain it to the patient. We are going to skip that. We will discuss that in the physical exam cages. You, you don't need to even think about physical exam if they are, they are giving you a card, right? So most of the things already done by now, you just need to know how to manage this case. In aortic stenosis case, the positive points will be like, what are the findings you will get? In the history, you will get like patient was playing tennis or anything. We don't know what they are going to give it to you. Any, any of the exertion they are doing, 
So maybe patient was playing something and then had this loss of consciousness yesterday. What else you will get? There are a triad for aortic stenosis. The triad is syncope plus chest pain or chest tightness. And that's mainly on exertion and shortness of breath on exertion. So these are the triad for aortic stenosis. So you will get, a, get, the, get in this history that patient also get just tightness or pain, especially during playing, during exercise or exertion. Also get difficulty in breathing for the last two, three months, especially when patient is exerting. So these are the findings that you are going to get in your history, nothing else. In the physical examination, aortic stenosis is a valvular heart disease and any valvular heart disease gives you marmar, right? So you will get a marmar positive in this case. What else you can get? In the CVS, you can get patient's left apical impulse is displaced or sometimes even a visible apical impulse can be seen on inspection. On auscultation, apart from S1, S2, is there any added sound like marmar, right? So that's the thing you ask. Then examiner will say, yes, you can find, you can get, you can hear a marmar in this patient. Now, if examiner says marmar positive, you can't just stop there. You need to find out detail about it. So what are the questions you need to ask? Anyone having a marmar, you need to find out what, what is the position of the marmar? Like, is it in the aortic area? It's in the mitral area, tricuspid area, pulmonary area. And you need to find out, is it a systolic murmur or diastolic murmur? And also you need to find out that is it a ejection systolic murmur or pan-systolic murmur? If it's a diastolic murmur, is it a early diastolic murmur or mid-diastolic murmur? So the common things you need to find out from the examiner. And if there is any radiation of this marmar, and if the marmar changes with respiration or position. So these are the questions that we need to ask. So examiner only will say, yes, marmar positive. And if you don't ask further question, you will not get it from the examiner in face-to-face. -face. But in online exam, if card is given, they will write everything on the card and it becomes easier. So, in aortic stenosis, you get ejection systolic marmar in the aortic area, and that's radiated to the neck or carotid area. Okay, that's exactly what you are going to find out if it's a aortic stenosis patient. You don't need to memorize the other marmar because most of the time aortic stenosis usually comes in the exam, and that's the that's the commonest valvular condition which causes syncope. Other usually doesn't give syncope, but can give but aortic stenosis is the most important one. So just remember the marmar type, that it's a ejection systolic marmar in the aortic area, which you radiate to the neck or carotid. So you, you guys get that what do you need to ask? You need to ask where exactly is the marmar doctor? Is it a systolic or diastolic marmar? What type of systolic marmar it is? Is it an ejection systolic or pan systolic marmar? Does the marmar radiate anywhere? And does the marmar change with position or respiration? So now you already know that this is an aortic stenosis patient. So how you are going to explain it to the patient? That's your last task. Give diagnosis and differential diagnosis to the patient. So reading the task is very, very important, guys. In case of face-to-face -face exam, you need to remember your task. But in case of online exam, the screen is always there. You can see your task all the time, so that becomes easier. Sometimes in face-to-face -face exam, on the table, you, you can get the exam questions there, but sometimes you may not. So in exam, where you are going for a face-to-face, -face, you need to remember the task. Like, what are the tasks? For this case, you need to remember it. That's one of the things a lot of candidates miss. They, they don't remember what is the task. Okay, so that becomes so horrible because if you are not following task, 
they can't mark you and eventually you fail whatever you are saying. So that's important for face-to-face. -face. Now let's discuss how we can explain diagnosis and differential in this case. So you will say, John, from the history and physical examination, most likely you are having a condition known as aortic stenosis. Do you know what it is? No, doctor. Now, there is a lot of problem that you can do in just one line. Always remember, in case of exam, this is a provisional diagnosis you are giving. You are not confirmed or you are not sure at the point. You are a junior doctor in the exam. Don't play like a specialist in the exam. Always remember that. A lot of specialists fail this exam just because they are a specialist. Okay? And they, they, they try to show their knowledge. But in the exam, knowledge is not the only thing. It's mainly the whole case, your approach, your empathy, everything matters in the exam. Your knowledge is just 30%. And other 70% is your approach, your, how you are finishing the task, how you are showing your empathy. So everything matters in the exam, not only your knowledge, guys. Remember that. So always we say most likely this is your diagnosis. We never ever say that from history and physical examination, you have a condition known as aortic stenosis. If you say you have a condition, that means you are sure there is nothing else that can happen. As a junior doctor, we never ever say that. Even though you might be sure, you always say most likely this is the case. It can be due to other things as well. All right. So say in that way, from the history and physical exam, John, most likely you are having a condition known as aortic stenosis. Do you know what it is? No, doctor. Well, let me draw a picture for your better understanding. So in face-to-face, -face, we always draw a picture to show the patient that what exactly they have got. In online exam, unfortunately, don't bother too much with drawing a picture because they don't, they don't understand what you are drawing from the video perspective. But always try to show, like show some things with your hand, use your gesture and posture, everything. Try to, try to explain as simple as you can in case of online exam. Face to face, it's easy because you can draw, draw a picture and show it to the patient. So very quickly draw the heart. You don't need to be a very good artist for that. Anything will do as long as it has meaning. So say that this is your heart. Your heart has four chambers. Each of these chambers has a door-like structure known as valve. In your case, the valve that controls the flow of blood from your heart to the aorta, known as aortic valve, is narrowed. So if you look at my picture, this is your heart. These are the four chambers I'm talking about. And one of the door-like structure known as valve that controls supply of blood from your heart to the aorta, known as aortic valve, is narrowed. And this aorta is supposed to send blood to your whole body, including your brain. Now, now that your aortic valve is most likely narrowed, the blood supply is also getting reduced from your heart to your brain. Now, when you are doing exercise or exertion, your brain is not getting enough blood supply, and that's why you are getting this loss of consciousness. And also, when you exercise, the demand of oxygen from your heart gets increased. But because it's already narrowed, it cannot supply enough blood and oxygen, and that's the reason you get this pain and shortness of breath mainly during exertion. So see that the explanation should be as simple. So you draw the picture, you say that this is your heart, your heart has got four chambers. Each chamber has got a door-like structure known as valve. In your case, one of the valve known as aortic valve, which controls blood supply from your heart to the aorta is narrowed. And this aorta is supposed to supply blood to your whole body, including the brain. Now that you have got it narrowed, blood supply from your heart to the brain is reduced, 
And that's the reason you had a loss of consciousness yesterday. And because when you are doing exercise, your, your body is demanding more oxygen, but your heart cannot supply it because the heart valve is narrowed. And that's the reason when you are doing exercise, you are playing, you are playing tennis, any kind of exertion, you are getting just pain or shortness of breath. Now, it is very, very important to correlate a patient's symptom with your diagnosis explanation. Whatever you explain, you should always correlate the patient's symptom. This patient has three symptoms, consciousness, loss of consciousness, difficulty breathing, and chest pain. And you need to explain why this occurs. Patient needs to understand their symptom. Otherwise, it has no meaning. In a lot of countries, you just see the patient and just give the medication and patient even doesn't know why they're taking the medication. And that doesn't work in here. You need to explain each and everything to the patient before you medicate that patient. That's very, very important, guys. Always try to correlate the patient's symptom with your explanation of the condition. And that's how patient also feels that this has a meaning, why I am feeling this shortness of breath. Now, let's say your diagnosis is done. Differential diagnosis is a task. How you are going to say that? Say that it could be due to other condition as well, John. So then you go to the differential diagnosis that you ask to this patient. So if we go to the DD, then you will find out how to explain it. So you can say, John, it could be due to any other causes related to your heart or your brain. In terms of heart, it could be rhythm disorder, but you're, you don't have any racing of the heart, so it's unlikely. It could be some condition known as ischemic heart disease where your heart blood pipe doesn't get enough blood supply, but you don't have chest pain, which is specific to the ischemic heart disease. You don't have sweating, nausea during chest pain, and also your ECG that we have done was normal. So we are most, it's very unlikely that you have got ischemic heart disease. It could be also related with some brain related condition like head injury, but you did not hit your head. It could be infection in your brain, but you don't have fever, rash or neck stiffness. Could be epilepsy or seizure, but you did not have any jerky movement or you did not bite your tongue. Could be a stroke, but you, did, you don't have any loss, any trouble with your vision or speech, you don't have weakness anywhere in your body. Could be vasovagal syncope, but your, your symptoms and the findings that we have got does not correlate with a vasovagal syncope. And the, the, your loss of consciousness did not happen in a hot sunny weather, so it's very unlikely as well. You don't have postural hypotension because you don't feel lightheadedness or dizziness when you change your position. It could be hypoglycemia or low blood sugar, but you did not skip any meals that time and you don't have any diabetes and the blood sugar we checked, that was normal. Okay, so this is how you explain your differential diagnosis. There is no hard and first rule for that. As you can see that I just show you the differential diagnosis and I explain exactly how I ruled it out from the history. So if a differential diagnosis is a task, you need to always use this kind of thing so that examiner knows how you ruled out your differential diagnosis. Patient also understand why this is not my case. All right, guys, any question? Now, so you have given your diagnosis and differential diagnosis. Sometimes management can be tasked. Management includes your diagnosis, differential diagnosis, investigation, and management. So if a management is a task, it means everything. When management is a task, we follow a more broader approach. So we give the condition to the patient. And also at that time, you say the differential diagnosis. Also, we say if it's a common condition or uncommon condition. 
Sometimes we also discuss the clinical features as we already discussed in here. We also sometimes discuss the course of this condition, like is it a treatable condition? Is it going to be a... Sometimes we say complication, what can happen? Try not to explain complication too much for the first time, unless it's a cancer-related case. So that's called 5C we use for explanation. So we use, we give the condition. We say it's a common or uncommon condition, so commonality. Clinical feature, course of the condition, and complication. Complication, I try not to say too much in, in, the, in these cases, unless it is really important. Okay, so in this case, you, you did your condition, you say the features, you, then you can say, please don't worry, it's not an uncommon condition. Always reassure the patient as much as you can. Unless patient is a terminally ill patient, you always reassure the patient in the exam. So please don't worry. It's not an uncommon condition. The first thing that I need to do is to confirm my diagnosis and rule out other diagnosis. If you are in, if you're in the GP center, this patient needs to be sent to a hospital for further investigation and management. If it's in the hospital, you have to admit the patient. Okay, so that come, there comes your another thing. You have to always look into the question that if it's a GP setting or if it's a hospital setting. And your management is different based on GP and emergency department in the hospital. So let's say this is a GP setting and you are dealing with this patient. You will say, please don't worry. It's not an uncommon condition. Now to confirm my diagnosis and to rule other diagnosis, you need some further investigation. And that's why I need to refer you. Now, always remember, if you are sending the patient to the hospital, don't use the term refer. You say that you are going to send the patient to the hospital. Because referring means in GP setting, sometimes we refer a patient and patient gets to see it by the hospital team after a year. So that's why you don't use the term refer when you are sending the patient to the ED. So say that, I'm going, that's why I need to send you to the hospital. In the hospital, you will be admitted and you will be seen by a cardiologist or a heart specialist. And based on the cardiologist, most likely they are going to do some investigations, including full blood examination, your kidney function, inflammatory marker. They can also do a ECG to find out your heart condition. They can do a chest X-ray and an echocardiogram to confirm the narrowing of your heart valve. The further treatment will be based on the confirmation of your condition. And if it is confirmed, then it will be based on the degree of narrowing of your heart valve. Okay, most of the time, if you are symptomatic like this and your heart valve is severely narrowed, they might want to go for a surgical replacement of your heart valve. But it depends on your symptoms, severity, your comorbidities, and most importantly, what you want to do. And also, a specialist will discuss in detail about the options that you have got. Once you are discharged from the hospital, I will again follow you up on a regular basis. And we will discuss in detail about some of the lifestyle modifications that you can do. Okay, do you have any, con do you have any questions, John? Now, then if you get some time, always wrap up. If you are actually sending a patient to the hospital, wrap up in this way, say that, John, I understand that it's, it's, it can be quite a scary for you that you think that you need to go to the hospital and I'm talking about even surgery, but please don't get scared at the moment. You are, in a, you are in a very safe hand and I'm sure the specialist will take care of you and manage you accordingly. If you want me to contact any of your friends or family members, I'll be happy to do so. But I want you to know there is nothing you need to worry about. You are in a safe hand and you will be fine. So this kind of reassurance means a lot, guys. 
even in the real life scenario, if you are sending a aortic stenosis, it's treatable, right? There is nothing to worry about these things. You just reassure the patient. Otherwise, patient will be patient will be die, will be dying in their head, thinking about like, oh, what's going to happen? But a little bit of reassurance from from you can can save all these conflicts in their head. And that's really important when a management is a task in the exam. All good. So when you are when you are actually explaining the management, you explain the condition, correlate the condition with their clinical feature. Say that if it's a common or not common condition, and say that if if this is a hospital, then you admit the patient. You talk with your senior and also involve the specialist, and then talk about what are the further investigations you are going to do. And remember one thing. You don't need to explain the management in detail because that will be done by the specialist. You just say that these are the investigation will be done based on the investigation finding further management will be done by the specialist. Can be conservative treatment, but most of the time, if you are symptomatic, you're having severe narrowing of your heart valve, specialists might want to replace your valve. But please don't worry at this time. This is a long run thing your specialist will discuss these things in detail and also discuss what options you have got. Okay, and lastly, you can just give some reassurance. Sometimes in our management, we also follow a 4R scenario. What is 4R? 4R includes refund, Review, red flags, and reading materials. If you refer a patient, review does not, like review is not very important, but again, you can just say like this, that once you are discharged from the hospital, I will, I will review you again, okay? So you referred the patient, you talked about review or follow-up. Red flag is mainly if you are a GP setting and you are sending the patient home, you give some red flag that if these symptoms appear, you need to contact me immediately. Okay. For this case, red flag is not important because you are sending the patient to the hospital already. Reading materials, you can say that you are going to give some reading materials in, in any case. Even if you are sending a patient to the hospital, you can say that, well, I'm going to give you some reading material about your condition, and you can read it on the way to your hospital. Okay, cool. So that's how we finish the management, guys. Any questions so far? And Dr. Nidhi, the refer and send. Referral means we actually don't use the term refer unless, unless like let's say a patient needs to, needs to be seen by a specialist in the outpatient department in hospital, then you can say that you will, you will refer, refer the patient. But if it's an acute scenario like this, you need to send the patient to the hospital, not refer. But because why referring means sometimes if you refer a patient to a specialist, like let's say for a knee, replacement, that patient might be seen by the specialist in the hospital after a year. So that's why like refer and send, there is a little difference between these two. If you're sending a patient in the ED, that should be send, not refer. Yes, Dr. Manos, the prognosis and the detail of the condition will be explained by the cardiologist, so we don't need to go in detail. And differential diagnosis, Dr. Neelam, try to at least include four to five important differential diagnoses. You don't need to say 10 differential diagnoses, but as long as you are saying the most important few, four or five, that's fine.
All good? Now the next task is your prolonged QT syndrome. See that we did not need any history and physical exam. We just need to know the management. That's the way cluster works. So prolonged QT syndrome, it's a 19 year old girl comes to the ED because she fell unconscious two days ago while she was climbing up a mountain. Take history, physical examination, investigation, diagnosis and management. So same thing, in this case, it's a 19 year old female, had a loss of consciousness while she was climbing up a mountain. So you will ask everything in the history and you will find out that this is the three episodes so far and each episode patient was doing different things. But each time she lost consciousness and that was like sudden loss of consciousness, like a cardiac kind of unconsciousness. There is no shortness of breath, chest pain or palpitation. Nothing is positive apart from the syncopal attack that she is having. And if you don't forget that family history, you will find out that she has a sudden cardiac death history in the family. And so you, you might find that history of unknown heart disease in maternal uncle. That will give you some clue that it might be a case of hookum or prolonged QT syndrome. In the physical examination from examiner or in the card, there will be nothing positive. So no murmur, no other finding will be there, everything normal. But there will be a task in this case. Ask investigation from examiner and explain investigation to the examiner. Any time, if syncope is a syncope is your main symptom in the in the case, your main investigation from examiner should be ECG. You can ask all other investigation, the blood test that we have discussed, but most important is the ECG. If you ask ECG from examiner, then examiner will show you the ECG and the next task will be explain that ECG to the examiner. Now explanation of ECG, I will discuss it in the next class, in the cardiology class two. So in the ECG, they will give you a prolonged QT. Now let's not discuss the ECG tonight. But give, let me give you a little bit of idea so that the next class becomes easier for you to grab. We are not going to discuss the full ECG, the only the important ECG for the exam. So you all know because you passed MCQ, you know how the ECG looks like, obviously. So normal ECG has a P wave followed by QRS complex and then a T wave, right? What is QT interval? QT interval means a starting of the Q wave and finishing of the T wave. That's your QT interval. A normal person, their QT interval should not be, should be in between eight to 11 a small square. We always remember things as easy as possible. So if you just remember, 8 to 11 small square should be the normal QT interval. If it is more than 11 small square, then you think about prolonged QT syndrome. Now, when you get an ECG like this in the exam, the first thing you look at is the lead two. So you all of you know that there are some limb leads and chest lead in the ECG. Limb leads is lead one, lead two, lead three, AVR, AVL, AVF, and the chest lead are V1 to V6. Lead two is usually the lead, which, which is a, the long lead given in the exam. In the long lead, you can actually see if there is any arrhythmia or not. So you look at the lead two or the long lead first. In the long lead, Try to find out P wave, QRS complex, and also T wave, if anything is absent or not. First, look at the rate and rhythm. So these are all the R wave, right? You look at if RR interval are regular. Now, if you look at here, 
this is one large box, two large box, three, four, around four large box in each of the RR interval. If you go for here, same, same, same. So it's a regular rhythm. When you get it regular, it means that it's not active fibrillation. And also, we will discuss that how SVT looks like and others looks like. In this case, you can see that there is a P wave followed by QRS complex. Then ST wave is also fine. T wave is also normal. Nothing is wrong in here. When you get nothing wrong, you try to find out the QT interval. Now, if we look at here, from here, from this is the QT interval, try to find out how much a small square is there. So we have got 5, 5, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So about 15 small square is there. So now you know that this is a prolonged QT interval case. Now, ECG cannot be discussed in, in one class like this, right? So it, there is a lot to learn from ECG. But for this particular case, you will find out that everything is normal. There is no ST elevation anywhere. There is no irregular rhythm. Nothing is abnormal. And then if you just count the QT interval, you will find out this patient is having prolonged QT syndrome. And this ECG, you need to explain it to the examiner. Now, how to explain ECG to the examiner? That's a class that we are going to do in the next class, because next class is all about palpitation and arrhythmia. So in that class, I will show you how you can explain ECG to the examiner, not today. Once you know that this is a prolonged QT syndrome, explain to the patient what it is. It can be very difficult for a patient to understand it because it's, it's difficult for you even. So how you're going to explain it to a patient? A lot of candidates explain the ECG to a patient. You don't need to explain ECG to a patient. They will not even bother about it, okay? So you just explain as easy as possible, as simple as possible. So say that Jenny from the history physical examination, and the electrocardiogram that we have done, most likely you are having a condition known as prolonged QT syndrome. Do you know what it is? No, doctor. Well, let me explain it in detail. Now, Jenny, remember that the nurse has done a test on your heart today by placing those leads on your heart? Yes, doctor. That test is known as electrocardiogram. The electrocardiogram of your heart is supposed to record the electrical activity of your heart. Let me draw a picture for your better understanding. So this is your heart. Your heart has four chambers like this, and the pumping of your heart is regulated by some electric current, which generates from here, and then goes down to your heart like this, and the electrical impulse travels throughout your heart and helps your heart to pump the blood from the heart into your whole body. And this ECG has different part which represents these different components of this electrical activity. Now, if you don't want to discuss in a detail like that, you can just say that this is your heart and your heart has electric activity to pump the blood. And your, the ECG that we have done, it has different part which represents different components of this electric activity. In your case, the part that we call QT interval is markedly prolonged, and that is why we are calling it prolonged QT syndrome. This condition is commonly associated with abnormal heart rhythm, resulting in impaired pumping of blood, causing frequent collapse like in your case. When your heart cannot pump enough blood, your brain doesn't get blood supply and you lose your consciousness. And that exactly happened these three times when you lost your consciousness. Are you understanding me now? Yes, doctor. Always try to ask this, this kind of question. Do you understand me? Do you want me to repeat it? 
Okay, so always involve your patient. And then you can give your differential diagnosis exactly same like before. Management usually does not come in exam. If it comes, then you follow the similar approach. Say that, please don't worry. It's not an uncommon condition. Sometimes this condition can run in the family or sometimes it can be due to some secondary causes like medication, if you are dehydrated or salt, or salt and water imbalance as well. But unfortunately, this condition sometimes can cause serious consequences also because you are losing your consciousness. And if you lose your consciousness and there is no one around you, it might be quite life-threatening. And as you are doing a lot of climbing and everything, and that can be more serious for you if you lose your consciousness during that time. And that's why I would like to admit you to the hospital. I will talk with my senior and also involve the cardiologist to come and review you. So this is a hospital setting, let's assume. But please do not worry, you are in a safe hand and we will do our best to manage your condition. The specialist might do a few investigations like some blood tests, including your full blood count, ruling out anemia, your kidney function, liver function, thyroid function, your blood sugar level. They can also do a ECG again to repeat it. And most importantly, echocardiogram, which is a ultrasound or a scan of your heart to find out how, how good your heart functioning. The management depends on your cardiologist and all of your investigations. Most of the time, cardiologist might start you on some medication known as beta blocker. If the medication fails, then there are lots of other management options like even a cardiac pacemaker as well. But I don't want you to think about it at this moment because your specialist is going to give you all, this, all the options and then you can, you can think about it and choose the best possible options that's available for you. Now also, if all these investigations come normal and we can't find any cause, then it could be just a congenital or a hereditary prolonged QT syndrome, which runs in families. At that time, we might need to arrange your family screening by doing some ECG in your first degree relative. Once you are discharged from the hospital, I will give you a letter to your GP and he will regularly follow you up. And then lastly, reassure the patient just like same before. Okay, so this is the management of prolonged QT syndrome. Doesn't come in the exam, they usually, because already you will get a long task. History, investigation from examiner, explain ECG to the examiner, and then diagnosis and DD. So usually you don't get management in these kind of cases. Clear guys, any questions so far? All good. Next case is postural hypertension. A middle-aged woman comes with dizziness for the last several days. Or sometimes they come with 65 year old comes to see you because he had a fall yesterday. No, you don't assume it should be mentioned in the question, Dr. Manos, that is it a GP setting or ED setting. Now, postural hypotension case usually comes with feeling dizzy or lightheadedness, or sometimes they also come to you as a fall. Fall, having dizziness also falls under the syncopic cluster. You will follow the same cluster, same history format, nothing else. The differentials diagnosis, these are also same. Now in the history of this case, you have found out that patient feels dizzy when standing from sitting or lying position. So that's your case. When you get that patient usually have a fall or feeling dizzy when they change their position, that's postural hypotension.
some of the other things that you should always find out if you get a patient with postural hypotension, the most important thing that you need to do is find out the cause of postural hypotension. So there is a lot of cause. It's not like just comes without any underlying reason. There is always a cause why this patient having postural hypotension. The most important cause in an elderly patient, like even, even a 50 year old, the most important cause is polypharmacy. That means multiple medication, especially medication which can reduce your blood pressure. Like if a patient is on diuretics, ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, so any, any multiple antihypertensive, if that can result in feeling this postural hypotension. Antidepressant like SSRI, tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline, those also can result in postural hypotension. Okay, so, and even sometimes antipsychotic like risperidol can cause postural hypotension. So medication plays a very important role. You have to always rule that out. So that's one of the finding you have got that patient is on multiple medication like metformin for diabetes, aspirin, diuretics, and ACE inhibitors. You need to find out from this patient that what are the medications patient is taking. And you, the patient will say that these are the medications I am taking. You need to go in detail about it. First thing that who takes care of your medication? Any chance recently any of this medication has been introduced as a new medication or any recent increase of the dose of any medication? Because previously patient used to take this medication. Why now this patient having postural hypotension? Maybe someone who is taking care of the medication, maybe they have overdosed the patient or they are not following the prescribed dose or it could be recently one of the dose has been increased or a new medication has been introduced. So that you need to ask in your history in here. And you will find out something like that, that recently ACE inhibitor has been introduced or the dose of diuretics has been increased. So that's one of the important thing. What else can cause postural hypertension in a patient? Any, any, anything which can cause hypovolemia can cause postural hypertension. Like if a patient has got recent diarrhea, excessive vomiting, excessive sweating, that can result in hypovolemia resulting in postural hypertension. So try to find out this, like any recent diarrhea, vomiting, excessive sweating. Okay. These are the main things that you need to find out from the patient. Sometimes if you get a patient who is diabetic, it can be related with autonomic neuropathy causing postural hypertension. This case also you have found out patient is diabetic for many years. Now, then you need to go in detail that how long you are having this diabetes. What is your usual baseline blood sugar level? Do you know your HbA1c? Is your blood sugar well controlled? What kind of medications you are taking for your diabetes? If a patient's diabetes is well controlled and HbA1c is less than 7.5%, very unlikely that diabetes is going to do any complications like autonomic neuropathy. But if diabetes is uncontrolled, then you should think about that diabetic autoneuropathy is a possibility in this case also. So when a postural hypertension case comes up, a lot of things you need to think about. You need to think about what is the underlying cause. If you get polypharmacy, then you, already, then you are lucky actually. If you don't get it, you need to find out other causes like any, any vomiting, any recent diarrhea, any excessive sweating, okay? Try to find these things in detail. If it's diabetes, then also go in detail like that. In the physical examination, you will find out only one thing that patient having a postural drop. What is postural drop? Let's say on seating position, patient having a blood pressure of 130 by 80. 
And when you ask the patient to stand up, their blood pressure became 110 by 70. If a systolic blood pressure changes more than 20 millimeter of mercury, when they change their position from sitting to standing, that's postural drop, okay? In case of diastolic, only 10 millimeter mercury change is enough for postural drop. So in this case, you will get postural drop positive, and that's your diagnosis at that time. And if you if you also look at the BSL blood sugar level, you will see it's well controlled or a normal BSL in this patient. So that's one of the cases in which patient got polypharmacy-induced polypharma postural hypotension. There is a lot of history that you can get in this postural hypertension case. One can be like patient was sitting in a charge and while standing from sitting position, patient suddenly collapsed. That's a typical history of postural hypotension causing syncope. Because patient was sitting and then when they stand, from a seating position, they had a syncope. The exact same thing can happen in vasovagal syncope, but in a different way. In that case, they will say patient was standing in the charts for a long time and then suddenly collapsed. Prolonged standing can stimulate vagus nerve, can cause syncope, and that becomes vasovagal syncope. So you need to... That's why history is so important to find out what exactly happened, okay? Another question can be like patient is a schizophrenic patient and recently they have started risperidone and now patient coming with dizziness or lightheadedness, okay? So a lot of things can come in the exam. So how you explain this? Say that most likely from your history and physical examination, you, you have a condition known as postural hypotension. Do you know what it is? No, doctor. Well, this is a condition in which there is a sudden drop of blood pressure when you change your position from lying or sitting to your standing position. This sudden drop of blood pressure when you change your position can be aggravated by many reasons. Like if you have a severe recent vomiting diarrhea, infection, like high fever, if you do a strenuous exercise, or in your case, most likely, the multiple medications that you are taking. In this case, if you get that patients recently introduced a new medication, you can also say that previously you used to take this, this medication, but now recently one of the other medication has been added and that medication can reduce your blood pressure and that's the reason most likely you are getting this dizziness or lightheadedness when you are changing your position. On the top of that, you are a diabetic. It could be due to other condition known as diabetic autoneuropathy, which can manifest as heartburn, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, or sexual dysfunction. But because your blood sugar is well controlled, I am thinking it's very really less likely. This type of dizziness or fall could be due to other causes as well, like it could be heart rhythm disturbance. So you just explain all these differential diagnoses one by one. And then management depends on where you are. This patient needs further investigation, admission to the hospital as well. So the investigation will be full blood examination, inflammatory marker, kidney function, liver function, blood sugar, and the ECG. Once we do the investigations, we will also consult with your doctor who has started your medication to review the medication for a possible change or reduction of the dose. Okay? The management of postural hypertension does not come in exam. It's most of the time diagnosis and differential diagnosis. Depending on what is the cause, management will be different. So, if it is a case of polypharmacy, you need to deal with that medication. So you either review the medication by the specialist consultant who has started it, either they can change it or reduce the dose, okay? 
If it's a diabetic neuropathy, then a lot of other things needed to be done. Firstly, send the patient to a diabetic a endocrinologist to control the diabetes. Okay, usually doesn't come in exam. Don't bother too much with this. If it's a case of risperidone induced postural hypotension, again, you explain what is postural hypotension and say that most likely in your case, it is the side effects of the risperidone that you have been started with. It is a very common side effect with this medication, especially in the initial few weeks of treatment. What we need to do at this time is to admit you in the hospital, observe your blood pressure and do some blood test. The blood test in the risperidone case, you have to include the risperidone blood level as well to see that if it is a toxic level or not. And after that, you need to involve the psychiatric team in the hospital to review the patient. The psychiatric team includes a psychiatrist. Psychiatrist might adjust the dose of the medication or they might decide to change this risperidone to something else. If they decide to change the medication, this patient needs to stay in the hospital during the crossover period, which takes around one to two weeks. The crossover period means the switching one antipsychotic to another. During this time, patient tends to get a lot of withdrawal effects. So that's time, the crossover time, usually we advise the patient to stay admitted in the hospital. Okay. And also sometimes you can always give some of the advice to the patient who is having medication-induced postural hypotension, say that try to take the medication exactly as prescribed, have a routine to take the same, take the medication at the same time every day. If you forget to take a medicine or forget to take a dose, take it within the next few hours. Otherwise, skip the dose. Please do not double the dose. You need to continue the medication if you, even if you feel well. Never stop any drug abruptly without your doctor advice. If you are having any side effect, inform the doctors who has started your medication. You can always follow a half minute or 30 second rule. So when you get up in the morning, sit up slowly and stay for 30 seconds. Put the legs over the side of the bed for 30 seconds and then slowly get up and walk to prevent any dizziness. So this 30 second rule is, you can discuss it with anyone who is having postural hypotension. All right, so as I said that where, where management is important, we will always discuss it in detail. Where it is not important, you don't need to bother too much with that. Like this case usually comes with diagnosis, differential diagnosis or Diagnosis with explanation of the reason. The next case is vasovagal syncope. Any questions so far, guys? I'm sorry that tonight we are taking a little bit of extra time because I, I have to explain each and every approach to you. So it's it is... It is very usual, initially it takes a lot of time to go into the case, but eventually you will understand the approach and it will be more faster. You guys are enjoying the session? You are understanding what I'm trying to say? I know that it's for the first time, it's a lot to take. All good. Next case is vasovagal syncope. Very, very important for the exam. 18-year-old girl fainted during marathon running during annual sport. Now fully recovered, mother came to consult with you. Task is history, physical exam, till the possible causes. Positive point in the history. Now, one of the other thing in your exam, you should always remember, it is not always the case that it, 
there will be only one diagnosis. Sometimes even you can get three to four diagnoses in a case. And if you miss one case, one diagnosis, you can even fail that case. So never just assume that the diagnosis will be only one. It can be multiple diagnoses. Just like this case, this case has three or four diagnoses at the same time. So positive point in the history that Garl was running for marathon and it was a hot sunny day. And suddenly, Garl fainted during running. So that obviously shows it's a visovagal syncope. If you ask hypoglycemia DD, you will find out before running, the girl also skipped breakfast today. And if you check the blood sugar level, that's 3.6. And less than 4, it's hypoglycemia. So this patient having hypoglycemia, having visovagal syncope. If you go to the physical examination card, you might also find out this child, this girl also having pallor. Why a 18 year old girl can have pallor? Any idea? What's the most important thing that you should rule out? Yeah, yeah, very good. Menorrhagia, right? So, Maybe you might miss that in your history, but in the physical exam card, you have found that, that this girl having pallor. And then you're, you just suddenly get a click in the brain that, well, why this girl is having pallor? Then you immediately, you should ask. Even in your explanation, you can just say, I'm really sorry that I forgot to ask this question to you, but does your child has, like, has increased bleeding during her period? Then you will get, yes, doctor, he's, she's getting heavy period since the onset of menstruation. That suggests that this underlying pallor or menorrhagia, that can also, also exacerbate this syncopal attack that she has got today. And most likely this pallor is due to menorrhagia causing iron deficiency anemia, right? So that's very important to discuss about it. And I would always suggest you, if a female patient in reproductive age group coming to you with syncope, always, always ask about their period history, like what, what is their last menstrual period? And also, is it regular or irregular? Ask about heavy menstrual period, like do you get excess pain or bleeding during your period? And also ask that, are you sexually active? Okay. If sexually active and also having syncope, you should always do a pregnancy test to rule out pregnancy or pregnancy-related complication. Okay? So it's always important. Even any syncope case, if it's a female in reproductive age, you will always add this question, which we in gynecology, we will discuss the 5P. 5P is the questions of gyne period, pill, partner, pregnancy, and pap smear or cervical screening test. We will not go in that direction tonight, but always remember to ask these things in a syncopal case. Now you have got that this child has visovagal syncope. Also, she has hypoglycemia and pallor. So you need to just discuss everything in the explanation. So you can say that most likely from the history and physical exam, your daughter, your daughter is having a condition known as visovagal syncope. Do you know what it is? No, doctor. Well, now let me discuss in detail the temporary loss of consciousness that your daughter experienced during running marathon today is known as syncope, which is basically loss of consciousness. There could be many reasons behind it, but in her case, I am thinking a couple of possibilities. One of them is vasovagal syncope. In this condition, in response to certain triggers, like overexerting in hot, sunny weather, can stimulate a nerve in the body, known as vagal nerve, that causes pooling of blood in the legs. And if all the bloods are pulled in the leg, there is decreased return of blood towards the heart. And then heart cannot pump enough blood to the brain 
brain gets reduced blood supply and that's result in this loss of consciousness. Please do not worry. It is very common cause of fainting and there is nothing to worry about. The another condition that can be a possibility in your daughter case is that she's also missed breakfast till today. And on the top of that, she did, did running of the marathon. And when I checked her blood sugar today, it was low blood sugar or hypoglycemia. And that also might be another cause why she had this loss of consciousness. Now, if you get pallor positive, you have to also include that during my physical examination, I also find out that your daughter looks quite pale, which can suggest lack of hemoglobin in her blood. And on the history, you told that she is having excess bleeding during period, which can suggest that she is having iron deficiency anemia due to heavy bleeding. I would like to do further investigations to find that out and treat accordingly. And then just give your other differential diagnosis. Now, yes, that's a good question, Dr. Nidhi. It depends on who is there. If it's the 18 year old, you can talk with the patient, like the daughter, if the daughter is here. The case is like that. Like daughter is a little bit of, like she had a syncopal attack, so she is not here. She's taking rest, but mother came here to discuss it with you. Now, that's a good question. If you, you usually don't discuss anything about an adult patient with anyone else. If you are discussing it with the mother, you have to ask to the mother that, I understand that you are worried about your daughter, but because your daughter is 18 year old, I need permission to discuss this condition with your daughter first. If your daughter permits, and she's happy for me to discuss this with you, then I will be able to do that. Most of the time, the mother will say, doctor, that's fine. She, she has given me the consent to discuss it with you. If that's the case, you can, you can talk about it. If it's a face-to-face, -face, you can actually ask to the examiner that, examiner, I would like to know if the mother has the permission to discuss about the daughter condition. Examiner says, yes, you can proceed. So that's also another thing that you can do. No, if it's 16, you don't need to get the consent. You can, without consent, you can talk to their mother. All right, the last case for tonight in this cluster is recurrent fall. So you guys can see that how many cases we have done without even touching the history and physical exam. Just discussing the management, we are doing four or five cases, maybe six from, for this recurrent fall, right? So six cases we are doing. And now let's think that if you need to memorize or remember six cases differently, how much difficult it will be. So that's the way to learn, okay? Being smart in the exam is important. It's not about just memorizing the questions and cases. You will never ever pass the exam in that way. Now, cases comes with recurrent fall. In recurrent fall, that's exactly same like your syncope, but a little bit of other questions we need to add in here. So let's say, Recurrent fall, only pharmacy you should add as your differential. Postural hypotension is usually the most important cause, which can be related with only pharmacy also. Bleeding from anywhere, diarrhea, vomiting, fever. You have CVS cause, CNS cause. You have vasovagal syncope. Now in here, we need to add endocrine and electrolyte abnormality. In endocrine, you have got diabetes, hypoglycemia can cause recurrent fall, even hyperglycemia causing diabetic complication can also result in recurrent fall. What are the diabetic complications which can cause recurrent fall? Diabetic retinopathy. So if there is a retinopathy and patient does not have a good vision, 
they can fall recurrently. So that's one thing. Having a diabetic peripheral neuropathy, patient does not even feel where they are stepping. Okay? So because of the loss of sensation in their foot, they don't even know if it is a stair they are stepping, and then they can have a fall. So that's neuropathy is important to rule out. Electrolyte abnormality like vomiting, diarrhea, anemia is important. Having troubled vision and hearing can be a cause. And always, always try to find out the home situation. Like most of this patient lives alone, like a 60-year-old living alone at home, does not have any support. That's one thing. Sometimes they can have like poor lighting in their house. They can have loose carpet in their house, okay? So, or, or they might not have a good handle in the stair. So all of these things can result in recurrent fall in this patient. And it is very important to deal with that as well. It's not always the medical thing. It's you, when you are a doctor, you need to think everything. It's not only you are treating the medical condition, you are treating the person as a whole. And sometimes this kind of patient always have degenerative arthritis, like osteoarthritis. All of them has some kind of joint problem that can also result in reduced mobility and recurrent fall. So these are all your differential diagnoses or causes of recurrent fall that you need to rule out. Now in the history, everything will be same. Now, obviously, you need to reassure the patient a lot in here. Then start your question about the fall. So that means that how many episodes so, so far, what exactly were you doing when this fall happened? Okay. So what you are doing in here, pre-fall, I mean, before fall, what happens? During fall and after fall. Same like pre-syncope, syncope, post-syncope. Post then move on to the differential. CVS, CNS question, exactly same like before postural hypotension question, then anemia related question, and then you move into your past medical history. In the past medical history, you ask about how's your general health? Do you have any medical condition like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart condition, or a stroke? These are very important medical condition that you need to ask. One of the cases you will find out that patient is diabetic. And if it is diabetic, you need to go in detail in here. So since when you are diabetic, is it well controlled? Are you taking any medication for that? What kind of medication you are taking? Who takes care of your medication? Are you regular with your specialist? When was the last time you have your blood test checkup to see your diabetic control? And do you know your recent HPA1C. Do you have any complications of diabetes, like any trouble with your vision, any numbness, tingling sensation, or loss of sensation in your foot? All these things needed to be asked. Very, very important. And in this case, you might find out patient's diabetes is not well controlled, and he has difficulty with vision, and also having difficulty with sensation in the lower leg or feet. Okay, so that's diabetic question. You also ask about their medication history because polypharmacy is one of the important cause of recurrent fall. Recurrent fall case also comes with postural hypotension due to polypharmacy. So do not forget this. Ask about their home situation. So who do you live with at home? Do you have any support? Any loose carpets at home? Any problem with lighting? How is your mobility? Do you have any joint pain? Any problem with walking or keeping balance? Ask about SADMA, social history and support at the end. Okay. So that's all about the recurrent fall questions. Everything is same. We are just adding some, some new questions in the history. Physical examination, more, more, or, more or less same. But in this case, if it's a diabetic patient, you need to find out 
diabetic retinopathy and peripheral neuropathy in your examination. So general appearance, vitals, BMI, pickles, then start with eye exam. So in eye, you would like to know the visual acuity, visual field, and also you would like to do a fundoscopy. If you say fundoscopy, examiner can say that patient having great forward or patient having features of diabetic retinopathy. So now you have got a finding diabetic retinopathy. You do CVS exam like before, CNS exam. You will say that I would like to do full central nervous system examination of both upper limb and lower limb, uh, including the cranial nerve. But I would like to mainly focus on the finding of any diabetic peripheral neuropathy. If you use that term, examiner can say, yes, patient having blobs and stoking sensation loss in the lower leg. You would also like to check the musculoskeletal system, looking for any joint stiffness, pain, or tenderness. And lastly, office test, urine dipstick, and BSL. In the blood sugar level, you will find out patient blood sugar is like 22 millimole, or very, very uncontrolled diabetes. So positive points, three episodes of fall. Patient is diabetic for 10 years, having numbness, tingling, having vision problem, having knee joint pain, previously had a stroke, having trouble with walking and taking physiotherapy now. Physical exam, fundoscopy shows retinopathy, peripheral neuropathy positive and BSL 16. So these are your positive point. How you are going to explain it? Say that most likely, the cause of your recurrent fall is uncontrolled blood sugar causing complication. In, our, in my physical examination, I have found that you are having peripheral neuropathy and diabetic retinopathy. Let me explain it. In peripheral neuropathy, the nerves that supply your foot or extremities got affected, causing numbness or loss of sensation. And that's why sometimes you even don't feel where you are stepping and you can have a fall. Also, we have found some eye changes related to your diabetes, which is affecting your vision. Now, if you have a trouble with your vision, you can also have fall because you don't know where you are, you are stepping. Other than that, you also having some knee joint changes related with osteoarthritis, which can also cause recurrent fall as well. All of these things in together putting you in risk of having a recurrent fall again and again. Please don't worry. Now that you are here, I will try my best to manage it. It could be due to other causes as well, then give the all other differentials. Okay? So that's how you have to discuss the causes in here. So that's recurrent fall. Any question, guys, you guys understood? I know that I was a little fast, but if you guys have any question, just feel free to ask me. No, you don't need to tell how you're going to do fundoscopy step by step. You just say that you would like to do fundoscopy and fundoscopy finding will be given to you in face-to-face. -face. And Dr. Javaid, it depends. Patient knows what is diabetes, but if they don't, you should always say, do you have any history of increased blood sugar or increased blood pressure? And yes, Dr. Jahedul, you can write down positive findings during any exam, but please do not do that because you don't have that much time in your exam. Okay? you will know what, what are the findings. When you do a lot of role play, the positive findings will be in your head. But if you want to write, you can just write very quickly, that's fine.
So this is all about our today's session, guys. And Dr. Dr. Monir, like recurrent fall management does not come in exam. It's actually a multidisciplinary team should be involved in here. Patient needs to be sent to a recurrent fall clinic where this patient will be assessed by a multidisciplinary team, physiotherapist, occupational therapist, social worker, and also this patient, you will be the GP who will be coordinating everything. And you need to send this patient to a diabetic specialist as well to, to control the diabetes. The occupational therapist will go to the patient home to find out if there is any poor lighting, any loose carpets, or if there is, if there is any trouble with the stairs. And then they, are, they will try to improve the home situation if needed. Social workers, sometimes if patient needs help with shopping or gardening, they will help with the patient about that. Physiotherapist will help the patients with the knee pain that he is having. So all these special, all these allied health professionals will come and help the patients. And yes, there is meals on wheels. If patient cannot have their, have their meal cooked by themselves, we can also involve a social worker who can involve these meals on wheels for them to cook the food or have a food to, it, to their home. So a lot of things that can be done as part of management. No, Dr. Javaid, you need to read the AMC clinical handbook. There is no alternative for that. All right, guys. So that's pretty much everything about syncope cluster. I'm, again, I'm sorry to take a long class like this. I was not trying to scare you first time, but somehow it was extended. Normally, the classes are two, two and a half hours, not, not, not big like this. But initially, for a few, few days, this will be like this, I guess. And I hope you guys understood the cages, understood the approach a little bit. Time to time, throughout the discussion, you will learn a lot and you will understand these things more better every day, okay? Feel, feel free to ask any questions about these cages in the next class also. We'll try to finish the cardiology in the next class. But don't think that in one day you will learn how AMC Clinical works. If there is a lot of things to learn and I can't also like show you everything in one class. So, Please remember, every day you take a class, you learn a new thing, okay? And once you do the role play with your partner, you also learn a lot of approach, a lot of ways to say things to a person, okay? So do the role play, start reading the handbook as well. And once, you, once we finish the two weeks free session, we will have a formal, formal class with with the course candidates to show you how actually we are going to take the classes and everything, how you can get an access to the software, get the notes and recordings and everything. Okay, so just wait for these two weeks free sessions to finish. I know that a lot of you are here who are already enrolled in the course. Just wait for this two week session, please. And then we will do a formal orientation class as well. Yes, Dr. Nidhi, there are, there are some payment for those social workers and everything. And those who are in the Facebook, do you guys have any question? No question, I guess. All right, so I'm going to finish tonight's session in here. There is a class in the middle with a random role play session on Tuesday. I guess you got the schedule in the Facebook. That will be taken by Dr. Cynthia and we'll do some random role play sessions. It, it does not connect any particular cluster or anything. Random role play sessions are done to, to give you a exam-like feeling because in exam, you, know, you will not get a cluster. You will not know what the diagnosis is. So random role play are supposed to help you to to show you how you can reach into a diagnosis in the case. Okay, it's a feeling that you might get in the exam when you get something which is totally new. Okay, 
initially it will be so confusing and so scary but eventually by two to three months you will be pro okay so we'll see you in the next class thank you for joining and it's staying late with me and i hope that you guys enjoy enjoy the class and learn something have a good night bye